Well, welcome again, everybody, to Asbury United Methodist Church, to our combined worship service here in the sanctuary. Uh, my name is Chris Jones. I'm one of the pastors of this amazing congregation, and I'm so proud and uh, just humbled by all the amazing things that God has done in our church over this last year. Amen? Let's celebrate. Well, at this time, as we transition into a time of um, preaching, proclamation, I would invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we are amazed that you choose to use everyday, ordinary people like us to accomplish your purposes, to make your kingdom known, to draw people into relationship with you. God, thank you so much for this powerful service that we have experienced so far, uh, the students that we have confirmed, uh, the amazing music that we have heard and experienced, and uh, uh, hearing all the wonderful things that you have done at Asbury over the course of this last year, and of course, as Pastor Will said, that list was not exhaustive. There's so many other things, God, um, some of which we're just not aware of, and yet your kingdom work is going forward in our midst, and we celebrate that, and we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor and adoration. God, I ask that um, this morning, as we head into a time of preaching, uh, that you would use me as a preacher, if necessary, speak in spite of me, open up our hearts and our minds and our souls so that we might indeed hear a word from you. We ask all these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we have a mission here at Asbury United Methodist Church, and it's at the core of everything we do as a congregation. In fact, as a church family, we recite this mission at the end of every worship service. What is it? To know the love of Jesus Christ and pass it on. To know the love of Jesus Christ and pass it on. You got a fist bump, too, as you say, pass it on. Uh, we don't simply want to know the love of Jesus Christ in a personal way, as important as that is, but we also want to share Jesus' love with other people. Amen? Well, a huge part of fulfilling this mission, passing on the love of Jesus, involves engaging in this activity that the church has historically called witnessing, sharing our faith. And in my experience as a pastor, people in churches get really nervous around this topic, don't they? They wonder, how do I share my faith with somebody in a way that works and feels natural without coming off as weird, off-putting, obnoxious? You ever wondered that before? Well, listen, just to alleviate any negative feelings that we might have right now, I want us to know that even well-regarded Christians throughout history, have not done this witnessing thing perfectly. Take this guy, for example, up here on the screen, Eugene Peterson. Anybody ever heard of Eugene Peterson before? Up until his death in 2018, Eugene Peterson was considered a spiritual giant. He authored books on spirituality and the Christian life. In fact, he's the guy who translated the Message Bible, which maybe some of you have used before in your Bible reading. Well, in one of his books, Eugene Peterson talks about how he grew up in a very devout Christian home. And when he entered first grade, he felt the tension of life with non-Christians. One of these non-Christians was a second grade bully named Garrison Johns, who picked Eugene Peterson out to be his victim. This is what Eugene Peterson shares about that experience. He says, I had been prepared for the wider world of neighborhood and school by memorizing, bless those who persecute you, and turn the other cheek. I don't know how Garrison Johns knew that about me, some sixth sense that bullies have, I suppose. But most afternoons after school, he would catch me, and he would beat me up. He also found out that I was a Christian and taunted me with the words, Jesus sissy. I arrived home most afternoons bruised and humiliated. My mother told me that this had always been the way of Christians in the world and that I had better get used to it. She also told me that I was to pray for him. Then something unexpected happened. I was with my neighborhood friends on this day, seven or eight of them, when Garrison caught up with us and started in on me, jabbing me and taunting me. That's when it happened. Something snapped. For just a moment, the Bible verses disappeared from my consciousness, and I grabbed Garrison. To my surprise and his surprise, I was stronger than he was. I wrestled him to the ground, sat on his chest, and pinned his arms to the ground with my knees. I couldn't believe it. 
He was helpless. At my mercy, it was too good to be true. I hit him in the face with my fist. It felt good. And I hit him again. And then he says this, blood spurted from his nose, a lovely crimson on the snow. This is the guy who translated the Message Bible. Even when he's beating somebody up, he still manages to be a wordsmith. I said to Garrison, say uncle. He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood, more cheering, and then my Christian training reasserted itself. I said, say I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood. I tried again. Say I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he said it. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Garrison Johns was my first Christian convert. <laughs> I want us to all be clear. That does not count, okay? Are we all clear about that? <laughs> Folks, no matter how bad you think you are at witnessing, there is a really good chance you have not done worse than that. Well, today we are wrapping up our sermon series that we've been in over the past month or so uh, entitled, it's up here on the screen, A Community That Thrives, A Community That Thrives. Um, in these messages, we've been exploring, we've been examining uh, what it means to be a part of a United Methodist congregation like Asbury. Uh, when we join Asbury and uh, become a member of this church, uh, we vow to support it in five essential ways, five key ways. They're up here on the screen. Through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Can we say these five things together? Prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. All of us, if we are a member of this church, if we joined this church in the past year, or if we joined this church many years ago, uh, we have pledged to support the church in these five ways, through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And in fact, we heard these things in the confirmation liturgy just a moment ago. Well, having talked about prayers, having talked about presence, having talked about gifts, having talked about service, we now come to the last aspect of this fivefold vow, witness. Can you say this word with me? Witness. And as we've already discussed, uh, witnessing involves sharing our faith. It involves testifying to the amazing work that God has done in our lives and in this world and inviting others whom God deeply loves into a life changing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This has been the church's task and assignment from the very beginning. In fact, check out with me what Jesus says here in the book of Acts, chapter one, verse eight, and he's speaking these words, Jesus says, to the gathered believers in Jerusalem. This is just before the Holy Spirit came. Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my, here's the word, Witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. At the beginning of Acts, um, Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. First, you start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which narrate the story of Jesus. And then you have the book of Acts, which narrates the story of the early church, how the church got started, how the church began. Well, at the beginning of Acts, Jesus instructs the believers to wait in Jerusalem, the very same place where he was crucified and resurrected, to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come. And then once the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus intends for these believers not to stay in Jerusalem, but to go to other regions like Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus essentially says, hey, listen, there's a whole world of people out there. There are people who don't know me. There are people who don't know how much the Father loves them. You are to go out as my representatives and reach these people. I am sending you to bring them to me. Do you know what happens? The church doesn't go. Despite Jesus' command to leave Jerusalem, to go to these other regions, for the first seven chapters of Acts, the church stays put. 
they form such an incredible community in Jerusalem that they get comfortable and they don't want to leave. It gets to the point that God has to intervene and stir up the nest. Listen to what it says later on in the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And just to give some context here, this is what happens after Stephen is killed. Remember Stephen, the first martyr? Well, this is what happens once Stephen is executed. It says, a great wave of persecution began that day. That would be the day of Stephen's execution. Sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. This is where the church began and got started. And then it says, and all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Did you catch that? What's significant about Judea and Samaria? Those are the very places Jesus told the believers to go all the way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now listen, I am not suggesting that God sent that persecution. That persecution was a result of sinful humans who had it out for the church. But there's not a doubt in my mind that God used that persecution, didn't he? To get the church on their feet and moving to create this sense of urgency so that more and more people could come to experience Jesus' love. Where am I going with this? You see, the early church faced a big challenge that we in the modern church still need to confront. That challenge involves the tendency that so many churches have to turn inward. You ever known of an inward-facing church? You ever known of a church that was so focused on itself that it completely forgot about the community? When I was a seminary student, I had a professor who used to be a United Methodist bishop, and so he oversaw churches and an annual conference. Well, one time he shared with our class that when he was a bishop, whenever he was invited to preach at a church in his conference, as bishops are often invited to do, he made it a point to drive to that church the Saturday before his sermon. So the day before his sermon, he would park his car in the church's parking lot, and then he would walk around the neighborhood. And again, this is Saturday, so a lot of people are outside. If he saw somebody outside washing their car or walking their dog or raking their leaves, he would go up to that person and he would say, excuse me, I didn't mean to bother you, but I was just curious. What could you tell me about that church over there? And then he would point directly toward the church's campus. He said that far too often, the person would give him this confused look and say, huh, there's a church over there? I never noticed it. I don't really know anything about them. They sort of just keep to themselves. I have never forgotten what my professor said next. He looked at our class and he said, if you really want to know about a church, don't ask the people who attend the church. Ask the people in the larger community. That will give you a better indication of what that church is really about. So that begs the question. If we were to ask the people in our community, what would they say about our church? What would they say about Asbury? You see, often us Christians, including myself, listen, I am right there with you. We become so comfortable in our tight-knit community that we deceive ourselves into believing that the real purpose of the church, the main purpose of the church is to cater to those who are already a part of it, to serve the members and the attendees. And so instead of being the body of Christ in action on the move, instead of serving as Jesus' witnesses, Jesus' representatives, we become nothing more than a spiritual country club where everything is centered around us, everything revolves around us, we raise questions like, well, is the church meeting my, quote unquote, needs? You ever heard somebody ask that question? Is the church meeting my needs, whatever those needs might be? Are they playing the kind of music that I like? Is the pastor preaching the message that I want to hear? 
Are the Bible studies and the programs the sort of things that I'm interested in? Are they serving the kind of food that I want to eat at potlucks? I guess you're going to find out later on today. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Please do not mishear me. There is nothing wrong with enjoying a worship service. Amen? There is nothing wrong with finding that a particular sermon or a Bible study resonates with you. There is nothing wrong with having a musical preference. All of that's fine in and of itself. But folks, we need to understand that the real reason we have these offerings is not primarily for us. They're for the glory of God and they're for the people in our community. Yes, it's true that we come to this place for spiritual formation, but it is also true that the formation we receive here through worship services like this one in Bible studies and Sunday school classes and community groups and other gatherings like that is to equip us to empower us so that we could be sent out into our community to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our formation is for their transformation. William Temple was a leading clergy person in the Church of England in the 20th century. He one time famously said this, the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. What do you think about that? I mean, what organization besides the church exists for the benefit of those who are not its members? Does a gym exist for the benefit of those who are not members of the gym? Does a vacation club exist for those who are not members of that vacation club? Now, to my knowledge, the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of those who are not yet its members. Or at least that's God's intent for the church. At least that's God's desire for the church, even if churches veer away from that intent and that desire. When I was an associate pastor, I attended a clergy meeting with other United Methodist ministers. And as we were gathered together and talking, one of my colleagues opened up and she began to talk about some struggles that she was having in her particular church. Now you're gonna find this hard to believe, but sometimes pastors have challenges in their churches, not here, but other churches. This pastor said that when she arrived at this particular church, somebody on the leadership team came up to her and informed her that just before her arrival, that leadership team had taken a vote. The vote, which by the way passed unanimously, there was no dissent, the vote indicated that they would intentionally do whatever they could to resist growing their church. They didn't want to grow. To them, growth equal change. They didn't want to change. They wanted everything to stay exactly as it was. Meanwhile, as they took that vote, there were people in their own backyard who didn't know the love of Jesus Christ in a personal, life-changing way. The church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of those who are not yet its members. And yet so many churches steer away from that. How do you think that makes God feel? I think it breaks God's heart. Folks, God's greatest desire more than anything else in this whole universe is to have a relationship with human beings. That's the whole reason God entered our world in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus has given us a task. He has given us a mission. He has given us a calling. He has given us an assignment. It is not to keep to ourselves. It is not to obsess over our preferences. It's to get out of our comfort zone, go into the world, and make disciples, share his love, serve as his witnesses. I love what Jesus says about this at the end of my favorite gospel, the Gospel of John. Uh, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. This is John 20, uh, verses 21 and 22. It says, again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We are not alone as we answer this call. The Holy Spirit 
the very person of God, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday, as Paul tells us in Romans, the Holy Spirit is alive and active within us, empowering us every step of the way as we seek to draw people to Jesus. So here's my question. How are you and I drawing people to Jesus in our everyday lives? How are we intentionally building relationships so that others might come to know the reason for the hope that's within us? Carrie Oberbrunner is a sought after speaker, best selling author, has many career accomplishments. But more important than all that, he's a Christian. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. He shares how one time he was working out at his local gym, trying to stay focused on his workout routine, just kind of keep to himself. Well, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed this older man fumbling over his MP3 player and headphones. At first, he tried to ignore the man, but he could tell that this guy was getting more and more frustrated with the technology. So reluctantly, he stopped what he was doing, he went over to the man, he introduced himself, and he asked if he could help him. The man dejectedly said, hi, my name is Bob. I love to listen to jazz music, but I cannot get it to play on this dumb player. Oberbrunner looked at Bob and he said, you ever heard of iTunes before? Bob was all confused and he was like, I what? I don't know what you're talking about. It was then that Oberbrunner realized that God had put Bob into his path for a reason. And so he set a date where he could spend some more time unraveling all of Bob's MP3 problems. He continues the story with these words. Against his initial wishes, I visited Bob at his apartment. Turns out his wife had died a couple of years beforehand and all his possessions were crammed into a small apartment. She had been their main breadwinner, so the bank repossessed his house when he was unable to make payments. Bob and I made a makeshift space in his back room near his desktop computer. One at a time, I imported his jazz CD collection onto his hard drive, intending to transfer the MP3s eventually to his player. While importing his music, Bob and I talked about life, his wife, and God, the weeks following, I checked in on Bob often. Kind of funny how two guys who are complete opposites can become the best of friends. All because of an MP3 player. A short time later, Oberbrenner says, I invited Bob to church, deeply desiring for him to meet Jesus. After a few invitations, it wasn't just one invitation, it was a few. After a few invitations, he eventually accepted and sat with my wife and me last spring. After the service, we knelt near the altar, and Bob told Jesus that he wanted to follow him. Bob confessed that he wanted to stop trying to control his life and invited Jesus to take over. Bob wept, and when I looked into his eyes, I noticed the distinct peace that now defined his face. Bob changed my life and the life of my church. I get more joy from him than he'll ever understand, and I'm saddened by the reality that I almost miss Bob simply because I was too engrossed in my own little world. I read that. I'm convicted. May none of us be so engrossed in our own little worlds that we miss the Bobs, that we miss the people God puts there, that we miss a simple opportunity for witness. Because through these opportunities that come around every day, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, the God of the universe changes lives. Today is celebration slash commitment Sunday. As we've already said, uh, this, the purpose of the service is twofold. Um, we're celebrating the ministry that God has accomplished here at Asbury over the past year, and there's so much that God has accomplished. But we're also committing ourselves to the future. 
Because, folks, the reality is God is not finished with Asbury United Methodist Church. Amen? Asbury's best days are not behind us. They're in front of us. There is a preferred future that our God is writing, that God is inviting us to be a part of, to partake in. And so during this next part of the service, as I conclude this sermon, we invite you to come forward and to present your 2024 commitment card. If you don't have your card with you and you're in the sanctuary, we have some extra ones available in the back along with some pens and pencils. If you're worshiping online with us right now, uh, you can simply mail your card to the church office. Um, you can submit your card via the internet on Asbury's website, asburymaitland.org. Um, or you can simply uh, give it to us at a later time. But my hope and my prayer are that everybody who considers Asbury to be their church home, who is committed to the kingdom work that God is accomplishing here, will lay down a card. And recognize that as you do so, as you lay down a card here in this basket, you're also picking up a cross. You're living into your discipleship. You're saying, Jesus, I intend to give you my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness so Asbury might indeed become a thriving, biblically functioning community and so that more and more people, because we exist, might come to experience Jesus' love. The Father has sent Jesus. And now Jesus is sending us. So by grace, let's go. Let's come in. Let's be his hands and feet. Let's be his witnesses. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for this church, for what it means to those of us who are here, for what it means to so many people in our community in this world, and for what it will mean to people one day in the future, God, who may not know you in a personal way. Please, God, help us to commit, to give of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, so that we might be faithful to the mission that you have given to us, to know your love and to pass it on. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.